The Hidden Forces podcast features long-form conversations broken into two parts, the second hour of which is made available to our premium subscribers, along with transcripts and notes to each conversation. For more information about how to access the episode overtimes, transcripts, and rundowns, head over to patreon.com slash hidden forces. You can also sign up to our mailing list at hiddenforces.io, follow us on Twitter at Hidden Forces Pod, and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kafinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that helps investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens get an edge by equipping themselves with the knowledge needed to anticipate the challenges and opportunities of tomorrow. By sharing my critical thinking approach and by challenging consensus narratives about the power structures shaping our world, I help you make the connections to see the bigger picture empowering you to make smarter investment decisions. On this week's episode, I speak with Balaji Srinivasan, an angel investor, entrepreneur, and prominent futurist whose views on crypto, the future of education, and the network state put him at the forefront of innovation and disruption in money, business, and politics. I invited Balaji on the show to help me work through some of the thoughts and feelings that I've expressed in recent episodes related to the state of our markets and our politics. And while technology and culture may seem tangential to these larger forces that tend to dominate the frame and govern the news cycle, I would argue that they actually run directly through both of them. Because I think Silicon Valley culture and the ongoing disruptive dynamics associated with social networks, mobile devices, automation, and now cryptocurrencies are not only restructuring and remaking the commercial world, but they are increasingly encroaching upon the traditional assignments and obligations of governments and the state. We see this perhaps most notably in the case of privately issued digital currencies, but I would argue that this culture of disruption runs much deeper, and its consequences for society are much broader than most of us realize. In fact, I would argue that what we are living through today is nothing short of a political revolution. And while I think our systems of government are ripe for disruption, I'm concerned that the solutions being put forward by Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, financiers, and the broader commercial sector do not adequately reflect the interests or the concerns of the vast majority of people whose lives would be most affected by these changes. Nor do I think the implications of such a world for democracy and civil rights have been properly thought out. The second part of our conversation would normally be released on our overtime feed, but Balaji and I didn't begin to get into the network state part of this discussion and its implications for society until the last 35 minutes or so of the first half. So instead, I've put that part of our conversation behind the paywall and released the second half for everyone to listen to on the main feed. I think it's an absolutely illuminating conversation. And Balaji was incredibly generous with his time. If this episode makes you want to dive deeper into the topics we discussed today and you want a transcript of this conversation, as well as all the source material, notes, and questions that I put together and relied on in preparation for this discussion, you can access all of that either directly through our website at hiddenforces.io, where you can also go through our episode library, or by visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. There are links to both the website and the Patreon page in the episode summary, as well as a link with instructions on how to connect the overtime feed to your phone so you can listen to our premium conversations just like you listen to the regular podcast. And with that, please enjoy this enlightening and highly educational episode with my guest, Balaji Srinivasan. All right, Balaji, welcome back. Great to be here. So we were talking about the, I was trying to focus in on the deeper organizing principle or issue 
that would make this possible or not possible or create friction. And that ultimately is power. I mean, nation states, nation states are arguably the most powerful entities on the planet. They control physical space. They can apply pretty much whatever laws they want domestically so long as they can either get consent from their people or they can crush them one way or the other. Actually, this makes me think about something. Have you, I mean, you must have seen The Matrix, obviously. That's one sure. sort of analogy. But have you read Theodore Kaczynski's uh, Industrial Society and Its Future? I'm familiar with it. I have a riff on, on that from a different direction if you're interested, which is- Sure. I actually think, I mean, so that happened only about 30 years ago, right? Unabomber basically went and mailed bombs to a bunch of people to get his manifesto in, in the Washington Post, I believe, right? And if you think about it, he was willing to go and kill a bunch of people for the distribution. And I think about that for a lot. For the distribution? What do you mean? Yeah. Uh, well, so in tech, this took me a long time oh, to articulate this. Oh, to get this distributed, to get his pamphlets distributed? Yeah. What a fascinating way to think about that. Right? So wow. he literally, like at the time, distribution was so scarce that he would had to kill multiple people for the distribution Fascinating. 30 years ago, right? And now today, anybody can go and set up a YouTube channel and have whatever, a million huh. you know, viewers, right? And so distribution went from this incredibly scarce thing that you needed to kill people to get a Washington Post op-ed into like, or not you needed to, but this guy, this guy decided to, into something that was much more abundant where people are now trying to crack down on that, right? And what I think about often when I think about like Twitter is I'm like, there's a lot of people who aren't Ted Kaczynski. They might not want to go and kill someone for the distribution, but they'd certainly scream at them online for the distribution. Yeah. Right. And so that like, if you think about a power law, like maybe Kaczynski's all the way out there, their sentences parse, right? Like Kaczynski's sentences are grammatical and there are some interesting, I mean, he's a genius mathematician or he mm -hmm. put out some interesting ideas, but he's also a lunatic. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that that's actually describes a significant fraction of the people on Twitter who are extreme attention hounds and what have you. Right. Because it, it shows that this guy is willing to kill for the distribution. What would other people do if not kill? Mm -hmm. You know, something I've thought about yeah, a lot. That's really brilliant. I really like that. Yeah. I tried to get Ted on the show. You know that he was like, <laughs> when I really? launched the podcast. From jail? When, oh, dude, I tried. I mean, I, I was in, I had developed a good relationship with the warden of this wow. federal penitentiary in Colorado. You know, who's one of the very first guests I wanted on because I, when I started the-, the Was this Supermax? Supermax, yeah. ADX Florentine? Uh, no, I don't think that's the one. Maybe okay. that's the one. I mean, maybe. I can't remember now the name of it. That's fine. But it was in Colorado and it was a Supermax. And they printed out my emails, presumably, and gave them to him. Because I, I find him so fascinating because I think though he was clearly disturbed and in ways deranged. And clearly his tactics were immoral to kill people and maim them. He was in many ways, I think, prescient. And if you read his work between some of the clearly sort of odd, deranged, kind of insane sure. writings, there's this lucid prognostication that I think has in many ways really come true. Now, we're kind of moving off a little bit from the network state, but let's, so I guess- let's talk about this actually, because yeah. it is related. And essentially, if I'm to slightly rephrase what you're saying, Kaczynski is one of the most articulate exponents of what we might call anarcho-primitivism. And Ludditism. Yeah. And anarcho-primitivism, maybe it's a bigger word for the same thing, but it's essentially the idea that technology was a mistake, that the natural state of humanity should be like basically being in greenery, that we just need to destroy it all and stop and go back to Eden, right? And you know the thing about this is the reason that has appeal to some chunk of people is you know humans, in my view, aren't built to think quantitatively. So they aren't built to think about the fact that the nature that they enjoy is a very tamed version of nature, mm -hmm. and that you know truly being in the wilderness with rain lashing down and tigers around <laughs> is actually not fun. And humans are actually built to be technological species. You know, that's why we don't have fur mm -hmm. or claws, you know, like over time, a lot of those things have been, you know, pushed off of the mainframe or, you know, into, into devices. Actually, there's this good book called like how 
Cooking Made Us Human by Richard Rankin, I believe, where he argues that fire externalized certain enzymes that we didn't need as mm-hmm. much energy to digest things. I don't know if you know, you know this mm-hmm. book, right? No, I, I'm, familiar, true- I'm actually familiar with that theory. Okay, great. And so probably also true for tool use or whatever. Anyway, so the, 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 essentially the technology that we use transform us biologically. We evolve correct. along with the changes that actually come from our brains. That's right. That's right. And with that said, though, because people like nature, they sort of think, oh, I, this is my map to the anarcho primitivism kind of camp, right? They think, yeah, I tear it all down. It'll actually be better. And I actually think that this taps into like limbic system things where burn it all down, that's a human thing. Nature, that's a human thing. Utopian thinking of this kind is a human thing. So it taps into like some limbic system stuff where the natural enemy or the natural opponent of the anarcho-primitivist is the transhumanist, which is much more my camp, right? And interestingly enough, just to kind of maybe abstract that a bit, could you also say that it's really the evolution, the evolution of the human being to such a degree that what what you're looking at is a different species, is a different animal. Yeah, well, so the thing is that, you know, how would you measure progress by the year 3000, okay? A thousand years from now. I thought about this a lot, and I actually think that the, probably the single best ruler, you know, in the sense of like a ruler to measure things, like a measuring stick, you know, the single best ruler would be how much math do we know? Do we know new theorems? And the reason is math is cumulative. Math is abstract. Math is digital. If there's an alien intelligent species, it would know math. You know, if you've seen the movie Contact, it's actually pretty well done in terms mm-hmm. of, sure. you know, communicating in terms of prime numbers, right? Prime numbers are a universal and a very powerful thing. And so, like, if you say, okay, we are advanced in math, that would encompass a transition like the transition from, you know, the human ancestor to Homo sapiens. Right? Or the, there may be multiple human ancestors. There's, there's evidence that Neanderthals and there's interbred and there's introgression and so on. So the reason is like, you know, do we become like half machine intelligences? You know, is CRISPR rolled out? And do we genetically modify ourselves? There's all kinds of possible human futures that may not look very human at all. But how could you say that we've actually leveled up? Well, if you're better at math by the year 3000, then your civilization has advanced in a very fundamental sense. Now. There are a bunch of people who'd be like, oh, that's so horrible. Oh, and now I'm back in with the anarcho primitivists, right? But that's kind of like the choice in the sense of, you know, we're either going to go towards the stars or everyone's going to kill each other and we're going to regress to this Stone Age mentality. And I have been surprised as to how many people romanticize the Stone Age thing. They do so, of course, from their fast internet connections and their iPhones and their you know, climate controlled apartments or, you know, their manicured lawns, but they do romanticize it. They do, you know, and, you know, and of course there's someone who's, who might say, well, why can't we just stick in the middle? Why can't we just have washer dryers and like cars and lights, but not this crazy, you know, like limber generation, ocular restoration, brain machine interface type stuff that you guys want. And kind of the answer there is it's pretty hard to stop technology. You know, I mean, you can, you can tear down the Roman empire. You can, you know, stop it for a while at the, you know, expense of destroying society. And that may be the goal of many folks. And then there's the goal of transcending. And this is kind of what Thiel talks about, which is the race between politics and technology, between those people who basically just want to tear it all down, you know, who would vibe fundamentally with the anarcho-primitivist mentality. And then those people who want to transcend. This is really freaking fascinating. It took us this long to get here. So I have a a number of things I want to point out or questions I want to pose, many or all of which are philosophical. One is, is all progress good? How do we decide? Is it universally good simply to progress? And how do we define that? I'm just throw that out there. Then there's another question about what is the good life, right? Like how do we measure the quality of a human life? What is good? I don't know if you're familiar, you probably have read Nick Bostrom's Super Intelligence. This gets gets funneled directly into thinking about designing intelligent systems and AI. Do we, and you know, a, kind of a way to maybe crystallize it is, I wouldn't want to go live in the year 3000 with an alien species that derive from human beings that's very different from me. Maybe they're incredibly intelligent mathematically, but on a sort of psycho-spiritual level, 
there's no connection there. But would you want to go back to the year, you know, negative 500,000, uh, or actually I should look back at the exact history. Would you want to go back and live as, with live the as a human ancestor? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. You know? No, um, uh, no. But I mean, so that's a really great point. And so I guess one of the questions is, I guess for sure, this is really interesting. I mean, there's a lot of this just has to do with just an innate tension that comes out of moving forward, out of progress and identity. But I think maybe, Balaji, maybe the what I'm picking up on here is really the when things begin to move too quickly. Like, well, let me put know, it a different way. Speed. L- l- let me jump in for a yeah, second, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fundamental issue is I really wouldn't care that much if the anarcho-primitivists just wanted to go and live in the jungle by themselves and destroy all their possessions or what have you. But that's not what they want. They want to destroy yours too. They want to burn the whole thing down, right? Well, because like Kaczynski fires... says, you might as well like basically scrap the whole freaking system and start over. Exactly. And so these folks are essentially civilizational like suicide bombers, right? Yeah. They are not content with just killing themselves, which, you know, you might try to argue them out of it, but it's ultimately their right. You know, you can't stop someone from doing that, really. You know, the like euthanasia is legal in many places, and you know, if someone's really motivated, it's really hard to well, stop. Also, them. though, it's un- understandably they can't live their lives unless they have everyone else adopted as well, because there really is no longer any. There are very few places where human beings haven't actually entered and altered the landscape. So I well, understand their their perspective. So I'm. I mean, I understand it. I'm less sympathetic to it because if they want to just take off all their clothes and go and wander in the Rockies or the wilderness and and be like Ugg and live with stones and and try to make fire from that or whatever. They can do that, right? Kaczynski actually kind of did that. I actually, he had some skin in the game, right? He was like a mountain, he was like a mountain man for a while. We know just historically that like that civilized, more technologically advanced societies ultimately encroach on more aboriginal nativist groups. That's what happened to the Americas. They simply weren't technologically advanced enough to protect themselves from the Europeans, and they ultimately lost their civilization. Oh, that's true. But but this kind of person, the narco-primitivist, is not really even pro a primitive tribe, right? They're not pro anybody because they don't respect other people's wishes. Like, as I said, if they just wanted to get a group of people and just go, I mean, you're right that over the long swoop of history, civilization you know tends to expand into quote uncivilized areas. But there's tons of tundra out there, right? If you've seen a satellite map, you know there's a lot of space out there which is just basically wilderness, and they could go and live there. Well, and, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, except there you run into two issues. One, there's very little wilderness. Two, ultimately that level of the way that human beings operate in such vast expanses was because population density was very low. Ultimately, the planet's got way too many people to live that kind of life. So you'd have to blow it up if you really wanted to live that way. Well, so so this is the logic of the anarcho-primitives. Here's, I mean, the thing about it is I encourage, I mean, it's funny to put it this way. I encourage them to follow that in VR, right? Where they can basically be, you know, like Neuralink in in an interesting way. Do you know what Neuralink is? Sure, of course. Brain machine injury. Yeah. Neuralink may give them what they want in a way that they didn't realize it because it gives them a brain machine interface so they can visualize themselves traipsing through the jungle and you know they've got their fruits or whatever. And it's like the idealized hunter gatherer where they're all, always perfectly shaved and they never have, uh, you know, they never get gangrene. And so, like, like, so basic, here, like, yeah. go ahead. No, no, you, so understand, I, you understand my point uh, of view. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I do, I do, I yeah, do. Yeah, so, I, yeah. I mentioned the matrix. This brings us perfectly to the matrix. Before I we go down this road, I do just want to throw out again, because I think it's an important observation, how much of this is really not about having a problem with progress and change, but when change comes too quickly. We see this in sure. politics, and I think this is, this is what's scary to people as well. It's scary to me as well, that we move into a world where people very quickly disassociate with the physical world. And that, I think, is ultimately destabilizing and dangerous, because we do actually live in the physical world. Sure. So let me let me be more sympathetic here, right? So as I said, you know, like the anarcho primitive thing, the reason I bring that up and transhumanism is those are two, that's actually, I think, the real pole. That's where I think society is realigning towards. Let's call it technological progressive and technological conservative, right? And interesting. That I think is like the real pole where it is, you know, do you push 
faster? You know, do you push nuclear power, brain machine interface, genetic modification, space travel, the internet, cryptocurrency, life extension, limb regeneration, bionic eyes, right? Bionic limbs, all this awesome stuff. We're right? gonna have Drones, sex whatever. like they did in Demolition Man. We're gonna put some helmet on and who knows? Who knows? Right? Like you know, but basically, <laughs> like do, do you push all of that stuff, or do you pull in the other direction and try to hang on to the current situation, be as Amish as possible, or what have you? Or do you try to forge? You know, of course the, you know, like the triangulation of, of some, you know, okay, well, we, we go for it, but not quite so fast and so on, right? Okay. And the way I kind of think about this is a lot of it boils down, it, what's actually kind of interesting is the West is Black Mirror in a way that the global South and much of Asia is not, okay? Mm-hmm. I think of Asia, especially like, let's say India, Israel, you know, these countries are more like bright sun than Black Mirror. You're saying we okay. look at the same objective phenomenon and one, the West use it in a negative way and the East use it in a more positive way. Well, it's not just the same, it's made the same devices and some of the same technology. There's a fundamental difference, which is the introduction of these devices, of the internet and the mobile phone and so on. One of the most important facts of the early 21st century is that in China, the technological and political capitals were basically in the same place, namely Beijing. Right, because the government saw fit to make sure all the CEOs were in Beijing. Not, I mean, Shenzhen's a capital as well, but it's not the same as Beijing, right? All the CEOs are in Beijing, so they can call them all in for a meeting if they need to. The firewall is operational. They, they kind of set all it up in that way, right? Whereas in the US, the technology and political capitals are 3,000 miles apart, you know, DC and SF. Mm-hmm. And what that resulted in is it resulted in a situation where tech basically developed its own culture, mm-hmm. right? And one of the things is, you know, there weren't enough people who had careers in New York or DC or Boston who had a spouse who went vertical when Google went vertical. And if that had been the case, you might have had a degree of intra household, intra familial offsetting of tech's appreciation with the collapse of traditional media and traditional, you know, academia and whatnot, right? The academia collapse is about to happen. It's in process, but media certainly happened. Had that happened, had that occurred, had there been a greater degree of not just economic, but societal alignment, then the gain might have been, the the loss might have been outstripped by a gain and they might have been happier with it. Mm -hmm. But instead, it was 3,000 miles away and it was also something where tech is very largely populated by immigrants. So depending on your count, 60 or 70% of tech is it's Indians and Chinese people and Persians and Korean people, Vietnamese, South Americans, Nigerians, Palestinians, Israelis, people from all over the world, right, work in technology or came to Silicon Valley, right? And so th- those are just different social networks. They're absolutely not the old money of the East Coast, right? They're not the back scratching. They're not the nepotism. They're not the families who were here since the Mayflower, the Civil War. They weren't in the country for 100 years. They may not even be in the country for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't continuity. All these nouveau riche people were not married in. They were not aligned with these old families on the East Coast. And so the East Coast has just seen its fortunes crater and plummet as a function of this new technology, which is why they're all Black Mirror on everything. Now, I recognize, by the way, that Black Mirror itself comes out of the UK and, and so on. But but let's say that, that their vibe is one of Black Mirror because they feel with some justification, right, that basically the East Coast or the US can no longer win in a game of free markets and free speech. That's interesting. Wait, wait, so are you saying that, because this is something I'm not familiar with, what you're saying is that in the East, in Japan, in China, in Singapore, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, et cetera, that Japan the- is a little different, but leave them out for a second, but go ahead. Okay, so- In rising Asia, but also- In India, the Tigers and, and China? In the Tigers, in China, in India, and also to an extent in South America, Africa, a place of Africa, big parts of the Middle East, They've risen with technology. That's very interesting. That makes sense, I guess, right? Because their development cycle, they came into developed world status with the the recent information technological revolution and the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the opening up of global trade coincided with all of that. Yeah. So they're more, that's fascinating. That's not something that I'd ever put together. 
ever. Yeah. So it's huge. So, I mean, and now would you call them developed world versus I think actually that term doesn't even apply anymore because I now think of it in terms of how many times have you heard over the last year, year and a half, people say, wow, the U.S. is behaving like a third world country, right? Like yeah, I've said a, that before sometimes, like banana republic said, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you see the power going out in Texas, you see the fires in California, you see the fact that the public health has gone out. But the, the public health going out is like the power going out. It's like a public utility. Mm-hmm. You know, it means the commons are a tragedy. It means the state has failed, right? So like when the health has gone out, just like when the power has gone out, you don't expect someone to operate a restaurant. When the health has gone out, they're operating in like this biohazard thing where the state was supposed to control that. Public health is both a technology and a state thing, right? So all these people are saying, oh, the US is like a third world country and so on. And you know, the origins by the way of the term third world came from the Cold War when then there was the US and the USSR and the mm-hmm. non-aligned, non-aligned right? countries, or, yeah. Yeah, or, or really NATO, Warsaw Pact, non-aligned countries, right? Mm-hmm. First, second, and third world. And uh, it, third world just became a synonym for like, you know, like poor country, like messy country, you know, slums, dirt, you know, et cetera. And today though, really, I think it's better to think about it in terms of ascending world and declining world, because the US is absolutely part of the declining world. Most Americans don't understand this yet because they haven't been, you know, either overseas or they're in denial or it's cold How or something so? like How so? Can that. we distinguish between culture and power? So like, are you saying, because I would agree that in many ways, culturally, the US has been in decline. Relative in power, it has been in decline. But in the world that we're moving in today, I would argue that the country that's going to be best positioned is actually going to be the United States because of its geo strategic positioning and its geography. And it's also its rule of law, its natural resources, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So I actually did a whole thing with Mark Letter on this because some of what you're saying sounds like the uh, the Zihan thesis. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It, so bar- I, it borrows from Zihan and others, Tim Marshall and other people who it's very, very geostrategic, geographically focused. Okay. So there's some good things in, I have no, I have no beef with Zihan. He's, a, you know, like a personal there or anything like that. And there's, I don't know, 10 or 20% of his book that I think has some good stuff on shale oil. And I do agree that that at high enough prices reduces dependence on Middle Eastern oil, right? That part I agree with. Uh huh. However, I disagree with almost all of the rest of it, and I can give you sure. some reasons. Fantastic. Right? Okay. So, first, basically, so I mentioned this in some of the, in the Charter Cities podcast a while back. I can give some of the links. Which but, podcast? Uh, Charter Cities podcast. Okay. So with, with Mark Letter, but I'll give I'll give like the the quick version. Okay. So, first, uh, the idea that lots of people is a huge advantage is simply not the case in a robotic era. And, you know, like Zihan quotes, he says, oh, China's getting old and so on. I'm like, China's going to get robots. And so is sort of a bunch of the rest of the world. And if you think about Instagram and how Instagram with 12 people was able to beat Kodak, which had probably more than 12,000 at that time. I don't know the exact number, but it's in that ballpark. You know, the scale of people, the number of people you need to do something when it's digital is just far less. And I don't know yeah, if you've seen Yeah, in some ways you go- could say that lots of people becomes a liability. You could also exactly. do it that way. We're exactly. bringing us back, yeah. by the way, to Bill Joy, Why the Future Doesn't Need Us, where he was quoting Ted Kaczynski. And Ted Kaczynski talked about how in such a world, people would just become useless eaters and they become a liability to the state structure. And then you, this was actually going somewhere where I wanted to go, and I'll just throw it out there so it's there, is are we moving in a world where the elites are going to basically either decide to call the population or they're going to pacify them through VR and you know, narcotics and other well, say, neuro- neurological in- interventions. Cull would be obviously really bad. Yeah. You know, I <laughs> hope not. But what I actually think happens is human needs and wants are endless. And so what I actually think happens is neither of those two. I think, you know, if the 1800s was farming and the 1900s was manufacturing, I think the 2000s is going to be the obvious replacement that it's non-obvious is going to be investing. Everybody becomes an investor, and the 99% this century are investors, and the 1% are so 99% are capital, and the 1% are labor. Because investing in something is very similar to just clicking the buy button on Amazon. It's an unskilled process to just click the button. There's skill, of course, in picking the investments, but you can just follow a fund manager and give them a cut. 
And then the 1% are labor, which are the people who are actually motivated and capable of going and building new things. What does that, though, do for the social contract, right? So we, we've evolved a, a sense of morality in politics and a certain sense of, of obligation, right? The obligation to the community around us. So what is, in, in such as, you're describing an extreme ownership society. In some ways, you're describing a almost anarcho-capitalism, but it's basically a society where everything is based on ownership. Is that that's roughly correct? And then what does that do for a qual of you know people's standings, uh, you know, quality of life, et cetera? So here's the thing. I actually think, so I would actually not call myself someone who like idolizes crypto anarchy. I actually believe in crypto civilization. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of good things about crypto in terms of being able to decouple and being able to be, you know, quote, sovereign individual, et cetera. But I think the sovereign collective has a lot of power to it more power than a sovereign individual. And also it's more legitimate in a bunch of ways. And it's also more likely to be able to sustain itself. Like the problem with Ayn Randian objectivism or what have you, I mean, there's like, I find her books entertaining and so on. I'm not gonna be like, oh, everything in Ayn Rand sucks. But fundamentally, you know, just from a leverage standpoint, one person can't stand against 7 billion, but a group of people can often, right? And they have a common culture and a common, you know, like alignment. So in terms of, you know, what does that future look like? I think it looks like something where there are thousand startup states around the world, startup cities and, you know, city states and digital states that you can choose from. And you get to the age of majority. And just like you choose a university today, you choose the city or cities that you want to go and migrate to. And, you know, essentially everybody talks about democracy and capitalism. Those are very important. That's voting with your ballot and your wallet respectively. But the third force is migration, which is voting with your feet. And with technology today, with the internet, we can design political systems that actually use all three forces and just set the sliders differently. The way I actually think about this is if you think about the root of democracy, the whole concept is based on consensual government, right? The consent of the government, that's mm -hmm. the root, right? And so what I think we want to strive for, what I believe in is 100% democracy as opposed to 51% democracy. So in a 51% democracy, 51% can outvote the other 49%. And it's like, do you know what a Fosbury flop is? From no. like a, okay, if you Google a Fosbury flop, it's like you've seen it. It's like a pole vaulter who just barely clears the bar. Right, mm -hmm. A 51% democracy is like a Fosbury flop where you just barely get over the bar. It's a minimum amount of consent. Yeah. And what happens is 49% of people did not consent to that leader. And so therefore they tug and they resist. And so you have to use more coercion and more coercion leads to a backlash. And then the next election- Direct democracy ruled by majority, majority rule. That would be yeah. what you're describing. Exactly. And a bare majority rule is the best technology we had for a long time because- Well, we've had, a, had we've had a Republican democracy. So it's not bare majority rule. And it isn't even about the electoral college. There are things, and we have a constitutional government with a bill of rights. So there are lots of things that the majority cannot take away from us as individuals, which is an important well, distinction. So I, I think that a lot of that stuff, a lot of the American stuff is great for like 1776, you know? The reason I don't think it applies today, for example, is like the entire concept of representative government, well, a lot of it was invented because of constraints of space and time. You know, not everybody, it wasn't just about being informed. It was that not everybody could make their way down to DC to vote on every issue at every moment. But in theory, you could poll everybody every time. Now, to be clear, I'm not necessarily saying, I'm not advocating for 100% direct democracy. I am, however, saying that some of the reasons that it was designed were due to the paper constraints of what you could do at that time. And I think that rather, you know, when people think, oh, how do you modernize a political system? They're like, oh, let's put voting online, right? And that is similar to what we talked about earlier, where you've got paper, then you have a scanner, and then you go to a digitally native file and you start thinking about it truly digitally from first principles, right? And, you know, like, so you have offline voting and then you have like Estonia, which has e-voting, but it's basically the same system. And then you can think about it from first principles. What does a digital state look like, right? And so I think a digital state starts with the consent of the governed and a real people, you know? So that's a problem today is we always think about politics and why do you think about politics 
you're thinking about the law, you're thinking about the state, you're thinking about coercion, you're thinking about a gun as the most fundamental thing. And we've been so habituated to this. We think the way to get something done is to try to get a piece of the state to be like mayor of this or, you know, like head of that, czar of this, president of that. And then you've got a gun to point at everybody who gets in your way, right? You can coerce, you can mandate, et cetera. If you're CEO of something though, what you quickly find is your ability to say, I'm CEO, do it exactly how I want, is actually fairly limited. You have to persuade most of the time. You can't really mandate. And the more but you mandate- d- But you're doing that within a legal structure that ultimately has the coercive use of force that keeps order. Yeah, except the, the thing is though that we are relying way too much. Coercion is a last resort. I'm not an anarchist, but a minarchist or you know, someone who believes, not even just a minarchist, but just from a pragmatic standpoint, the more you coerce, the less legitimate you are and the less you can coerce. I agree with that. Right? And so what we have done is we've gotten ourselves into a state where people don't consent anymore. And the less consent, the more coercion. And the more coercion, the less consent. It's a negative feedback loop. And so a way around that is you build internet polities. So let me give you a concrete example. This, a lot of this stuff is in my book, but a concrete example. Okay, so Austin, Texas is running out of power. San Francisco has this terrible school mm-hmm. board, right? What you could do with the internet is rather than wait for an antiquated two or four or six or whatever year election cycle, et cetera, you can just set up the shadow school board. You set up the shadow you know, government you know, of, of whatever region, and you just start organizing people in a hierarchy where just like you start a company, you declare yourself CEO, you declare yourself the head of this community organization. You don't necessarily need to call it the shadow government. You can call it whatever name you think is suitable. Maybe it's like the community org or what have you, right? And then you start acquiring people. And you might say, well, what do they do? Well, you can't, you know, you're not a government, are you? You can't tax people. You can't point a gun at people. You don't have, you know, police or whatever. And you say, well, guess what? You focus on everything you can just convince people to do through volition rather than coercion, which is actually a lot of things. For example, you can organize everything from babysitting and childcare. You know, when when like you know folks need to rotate because they're working from home, you can you know organize meetings uh, where people align on what the curriculum is. Right, but the world. So what I'm challenging is that first of all, we know historically that there's a point of inequality in quality of life, at which point people will begin to employ violence in order to obtain what you have, right? Does that make sense, what I'm describing, or do you not agree with that? Uh, I think that that is actually more elite on elite violence in the sense that I think most of the people who you hear, if you actually go and analyze it and and you actually look at who the author is of a given piece, most of the people you hear talking about the rich are the, the folks who are angry that there's some people who are richer than them. Many of these people who are so angry are born to old money. Well, what about la- what about labor movements in the late nineteenth century? Well, they be- actually, they became, mean, very, they became very they became very violent. Are, no, 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 not Marx or, no, no, not Marx or Engels. Yeah, yeah but the, the leaders of those the, movements. Yeah, but they were tapping into a popular. Uh, movement. They created that popular movement. But you don't I think, think? Okay, so I let's say Donald. Organic. Do you think Donald Trump created the Trump movement? That it wasn't he wasn't actually capturing and politicizing something that was already deeply there. Yes, there is public sentiment, but I think that a lot of demagoguery taps into something that is a mile wide and an inch deep. And most of it is emotionally aligning people against something rather than economically aligning them for something. It's actually relatively easy to get people mad about whether it's immigrants or entrepreneurs or you know like this or that group of the day and to get them to destroy something. And of course, the US, you know, now that a big chunk of the country doesn't like immigrants and our big chunk doesn't like entrepreneurs, <laughs> it's not a great place to be an immigrant but, entrepreneur. But then, I mean, I haven't sat out to plot this, sure. but I would imagine that there's a very tight correlation between economic conditions, economic disparities, et cetera, and the rise of populist demagogues and even international conflict between countries. So could Hitler have taken over Germany in 1930, if he hadn't come in 1933 and it was a, you know, 2000. In other words, like there is a, a strong correlation between the underlying conditions and the emergence of a authoritarian figure who taps into deep rages. 
I think there is something to that, but I think, you know, it was more the initial frame on it that I wanted to poke on, which is you think about the Magna Carta, that really wasn't the king versus the peasants, even though it's often framed like that. It was the nobles versus sure. the king. Totally. Right? And so a lot of this stuff is really intra elite as opposed to like the poor versus the elite. But those yeah. elite grab their power, historically have taken their power from the people. If they sure, can align sure. themselves with the people, then they're able, and that's actually what populism is because the yes. existing elite have control of the institutions and the infrastructure and the military, and the populists offset that by basically commandeering the power of the population. Right, and here's the thing though. Basically, normally the way this is phrased is, Oh, these folks in the, in the U.S. are going to go after these tech guys, and you know, like there may be something to that. But here's the thing: Americans are actually like the global four percent, right? Ninety-five percent, ninety-six percent of the world is not American, and Americans have been rich for a long time. And it is actually once you're post peak and start declining, you're going to hear, I think, a lot more about American privilege, right? And everybody who is mad about Iraq and about the US throwing its weight around abroad and so on, you're gonna hear way more of that this decade because the US has relied on coercion for so long and so aggressively that it's less able to convince. I mean, this reads kind of that's, an apotheosis. That's a great observation. I mean, I, I, I certainly agree with the general observation that America has wrecked its credibility and it has made it very difficult for it to have the moral leadership to command the world internationally and to set the moral agenda. Exactly. And so here's the thing, like normally the kind of frame that you hear on this is, oh, you know, we're going to take money from these rich Americans and so on. And I'm not saying that there, there's something like that may not happen in the US, right? But the next step is going to be the world wanting to take money from the rich Americans. And that's going to manifest in many, many different ways. Like basically America is no longer like the leader of the free world. Because it's, I mean, this is not one, you know, presidency or what have you. This has been going back decades and decades. But most people don't realize this. Like COVID was like a military defeat of the U.S. in the sense that, you know, if you go and Google like 2018 national biodefense strategy, right? There is this whole document which purports to, here, I'll just Google it, you know, the exact thing. National biodefense strategy 2018, I think is the, the thing, Right. So it's supposed to prevent against both man-made and natural threats, right? Yeah, here it is. New biodefense strategy combats man-made natural threats, defense.gov, right? By Jim Garamoni, DOT News. And so this was something where it was touted as, you know, being able to protect against the biological weapons part of WMD, and there's like a steering committee and so-and-so is chairing it. And, you know, they even mentioned the Spanish flu and the anthrax and, you know, Ebola. And on paper, it sounded like, dude, we're totally prepared. We've got a plan for a plan for a plan, et cetera, et cetera, right? Of course, there was no plan, you know, or rather maybe there was something written down on paper, but there was no execution on that plan. And so this was a military defeat. It wasn't just that state, local, and- Does that imply also that you think this may have been a bioweapon? No, no, I don't. I don't think it's a bioweapon. I think it's possible it escaped from a lab that maybe the U.S. government funded, by the way, like the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Got there was some, some connection between Duke, I think. Yeah, yeah, the, exactly. Like this, the gain of function stuff. And so yeah, there, the gain that, of function that, stuff. There is a lot of credible. I mean, that is not crazy. You know, the, like uh, the, if you're a PhD, you know, I, I've looked at a lot of the stuff. I talked about it in actually early last year, um, and now there's been actually some pretty good work by a doctorate at MIT on this. So I'm, I'm forgetting her name. I think Alina Liu, I think that is, is it Alina Liu? I'm, I may be misremembering it. But anyway, the, the point is that the origins of the virus aren't actually what I'm focused on right here. It's more that local, state, and federal government failed, public health failed, police failed, fire failed, power failed, public schools failed. Um, the U.S. failed internationally. It was basically, I think it, it was just absent, right? And what you heard from people were things like, which is actually kind of remarkable, you know, if you mentioned that X country or Y country was doing better, people would sort of snarl at you 
and I understand why, because you're under stress and so on, COVID is a stressful time, but they wouldn't even be like, okay, we can learn from that. Maybe we can do X or do Y. They'd say, well, what are you, you know, are you not a patriot or will not last? And I'm like, okay, being first and the quote leader of the free world is extremely different than not being last. Hey, we're not number N is not really like this great rallying cry that people might think it yeah. is, you know? Mm-hmm. And people would say things like, oh, New Zealand, well, that's an island. Oh, China, that's a totalitarian dictatorship, blah, 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 right? At the same time that the U.S. is cargo cult copying China, you know, because the Italians did lockdown as a copy of the Chinese and the Americans copied the copy without acknowledging that they were doing a copy. And that was like the worst of all worlds because, you know... Um, well, absent the like locking people inside their buildings and I mean, the Chinese lockdown was on a whole different level. Yeah, well, here's the thing. So we don't know like which of those videos is real versus, you know, what have you. But it's absolutely the case that they took it extremely seriously. Yeah. And here's the thing, though. And this is an important thing. When it's China versus the U.S., people get crazy and irrational. Okay. How about Taiwan? How about Taiwan versus U.S.? How about democratic Asia and Australasia? How about Mm -hmm. the fact that- Japan. Australia. Yeah, Australia is conservative and New Zealand is progressive, but they both managed to get this under control. Oh, they're islands. Okay. And you you start going down this kind of list of excuses. And fundamentally, it's basically just something where the US is just not, it doesn't have high state capacity anymore. It doesn't have the ability to manage or build infrastructure or come to enough alignment on what to do. It's not really a country anymore. It's just like a, just a group of people in a physical area that don't share anything in common. It's very hard to think of something that every American shares in common beyond the fact that they're governed by this, you know, empire and uh, that they value the dollar, right? Like if you're trying to think of a value, it's not like, you know, 99.9% of people salute the flag or believe X or believe Y. That's just not the case. So I know that sounds harsh, but I'm just I'm making some observations. I'll, I'll drive to a conclusion. Let me pause there and see if you disagree with any of those observations so far. First of all, I love how you engage intellectually. It's so satisfying. I love how you think openly. As you were talking, what I started to get more clear on here is, and I don't want to divert any, anywhere from where you're going, I agree that we're dealing with a huge amount of dysfunction. I think My response to that has been, can we fix it? I think your response and the response of other people that you align with intellectually, philosophically, is can we exit? Can we build something better? Can we build something new? And I think where the tension exists, because I'm I'm actually theoretically okay with that. I don't know that I necessarily have an attachment to the red, white, and blue, okay? But I think the real thing for me is what do we value, right? You said it in terms of what do we share in common? What do we have in common? And I think that's where I find myself increasingly at odds with, I don't know if it's what the term would be, this cross-section of crypto and you know, transhumanism or futurism or Silicon Valley. What concerns me is that Silicon Valley's values are very different than the values of many people who live in Western democratic countries. I think that- Totally. Sil- and I'm sympathetic to that. And let me offer some thoughts. Yeah. Basically- I think the first network state is the kind of place, you know, like uh, let's say we're successful in this project is very focused on technology simply because of it's like, you know, when Twitter started, it was mainly tech people doing it, right? Lots of these things, you know, when, when crypto started, it was mainly tech people. And then eventually it grew into other kinds of markets, financiers, you know, like uh, human rights activists using it abroad and, and so on, right? And in the same way, I think that the first network state, state, I think, will probably be focused on things like transhumanism. But the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth might be veganism, CrossFit, maybe the Benedict option where people you know, can live like a Christian life, maybe anarcho-primitivism where they just get like a nature preserve and they can all be ugh, you know, which is fine with me so long as they're just doing it on their own, right? But here's the question though, Balaji. That, I think, suggests or that assumes that we, we, we can live in a world where we don't need to solve major collective action problems. And I am of the mindset that we are moving into a time where we're going to have huge problems of the commons that require collective level solutions, where we need strong governments in order to solve those problems. So go ahead. I mean- You may want strong governments in order to solve those problems, but you can't get those strong governments, or at least not in the West, 
without being able to start new ones. Because that's the thing is, it's not about the strength of the government in terms of how much it can coerce. We're so loaded on that, right? We're so like, oh, let's give Com- it more well, power. competent. I mean, also competent, strong government. Competent, I mean- exactly. Because here's the thing, like, you know, why is it the case that private companies could develop these vaccines so much faster? I mean, the US government, everybody has this mental model of the US government from movies. Which is, you know, which is probably more valid from, let's say, 1933 to 1968. Independence Day in right? 1994. Yeah, exactly. So, like, the, the period from Hoover Dam to Manhattan Project sure. to Apollo, right? Yeah. That was a period when technology favored centralization. And mid-century, you had, you know, totally. one telephone company and two superpowers and three television mm-hmm. stations. Yeah. Monopoly. And yeah, all the talent went to these gigantic countries and it was all, you know, focused at the state and the state allocated it and so on. And so you get these like books, which I very much disagree with, like Innovative State, which says all innovation comes from the state, all due to the state. But if you re- rewind the clock further backwards in time, of course, there was physics before NSF, right? You know, like there was engineering before you know any departments of engineering you know the railroads aviation automobiles those things grew out of largely out of the private sector i mean there obviously there's a public sector involvement in railroads but like the wright brothers went and did their aircraft their first one without any grants to my knowledge at least and you know if you go back further in time you know like statistical mechanics came out of actually the empirical study of steam engines. So it was the apply that led to the theoretical rather than vice versa. So you go back further in time and yes, science, technology exists without the state. Mathematics exists without the state, certainly without the US government. It is not a necessary condition. In fact, it, well, right, I would, I mean, I would just, what I would say though, is that the European enlightenment and also all previous intellectual flowerings were very closely connected to the state. Because the state of course is the organizing economic principle of society up until the last few hundred years. I I really I disagree with that. In many ways, like, you know, for example, in the Wild West, you didn't have a strong state. It was kind of organized by capitalism, you know, yeah. to, to a greater extent. Well, that, I mean, that was I'm, I'm, like I was saying, uh, yeah, after I'm talking about past the last few hundred years with the rise of capitalism. Well, you know, even like, you know, the Renaissance period was all these competing, you know, principalities. It wasn't it wasn't like a giant centralized state. In fact, there's an argument. Right, but they read, were principalities, in other words. And there's an interesting point about the rise of the merchant class, and that goes back to the, again, the beginning of this movement of capitalism. Well, yeah. So I guess, you know, if you read, there's a, there's a good book that also gives a counter argument here, Where's My Flying Car? Very much worth reading. That guy would be a good person to bring on your show, by the way. Hmm. Also, the Roots of Progress guy, Jason Crawford, also good. He wrote a book review of the first one, who wrote Where's My Flying Car? And his premise, which I agree with, is that the centralization of science, we don't have the counterfactual, right? Mm-hmm. We do see, and I did see, a lot of this being choked through bureaucrats. And if you look at the average age of, for example, the NIH grant recipient, you actually see like this, you know, bell curve-ish thing moving upwards in time, roughly by one year as the years tick on. It's like a cohort of people who've all just award grants to each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, just ages with time. And that is science by bureaucracy, which, you know, if you wrote an NIH grant, I did this like, you know, like now 15 years ago or thereabouts, but it's probably the same you know, or I hear it's the same today. Yeah. You really have to have done much of the work prior to even putting in the grant. And so you're getting the money for something that hasn't been done because otherwise the reviewers will say, ah, this is impossible or it's not not feasible, et cetera, et cetera. And it's this whole stupid bureaucratic process. And it's fighting for actually relatively small sums of money. I, I remember pulling somebody out from academia. I'm like, why are you spending all this time on like a $200,000 grant when, you know, like your colleague here has a $200 million in VC to go and do something real, right? And so the the point is that bureaucratic science uh, has a whole set of megaphones to herald it, right? And I'm not saying that there aren't successes. Obviously, there's, you know, what people will list, which are true. You've got the internet and you've got the human genome and you've got, you know, like the self-driving car, which came out of DARPA and, and whatnot, right? But we don't have as counterfactual, which is, you know, what happens when you have instead 50 individual billionaires who can do things like what Yuri Milner is doing, you know, with the Breakthrough Prize or what Elon is doing or what Jeff Bezos is doing now at Blue Origin. You know, I think we're going to see something different where it's not bureaucratic anymore. It's based on like you don't have just one NIH, you have 50 people who can fund at that level. And frankly, 
much of the scientific research establishment is just a make work program where there's like, you know, a relatively small number of people who produce really innovative research. And we're simultaneously too elitist and not elitist enough, Mm -hmm. right? Too elitist in the sense of lots of smart people aren't getting these, you know, like these grants or research jobs, not elitist enough in the sense of a lot of people who are quote, full-time scientists, you know, for example, in biomedicine, because you have these sort of slave labor wages that people are paying postdocs, you know, you don't have the incentive for laboratory automation. You know, you have people who are literally still manually pipetting, you know, 20 years into robotics when that's an obvious application for industrial robotics, when diapers.com in Amazon warehouses happened a long time ago. By the way, I, I'm not saying this as a theoretical thing. You know, you can see a video. I built a robotic sequencing factory with some of my colleagues. This is something which can be done. You know, can every single step be automated? Well, you might need microfluidics for certain pieces and so on, but more and more of it can be. However, if you have these postdocs who are just like paid small amounts of money, grad students are paid small amounts of money, the incentive for automation isn't there. Okay, what am I pointing out? Coming back at the stack to say a lot of this, the idea that, oh, the state is so great and so on, oh, we have to reform the state. The reason people think you have to reform the state or you have to do centralized science is because the alternatives don't exist yet. We have to build those alternatives, and then you can have a true comparison. And then you can say, yeah, okay, starting something new sucks. We need to reform something. But here's the thing. Whenever we do be able to do that, because actually the most important innovation sometimes is the meta innovation of being able to do something new in the first place. Like, how do you start a new currency? That was an insane concept in 2007. You walk into a VC's office and say that they think you're crazy. I mean, Peter Thiel and Levchin kind of did for PayPal. They actually did go in and say that, but that's not what they did. They built you know something that was difficult and valuable in a $100 billion company, but it wasn't a new currency, right? No, it was embedded so, in the system to begin with. It was embedded in the system, but it was, it was great. I take nothing away from them. It was awesome. Still, it was embedded in the system. Okay. So 2008, when Satoshi you know, came up with the white paper in 2009, launching Bitcoin, that was a true zero to one, an apocal thing, which innovated on how to innovate in the first place. Oh, wow. You can start a new currency. That's within our capabilities. I didn't even know you could do that. And now a kid in a dorm room can start a new international cryptocurrency. That's insane, right? And so now, you know, if you think about it, the growth of crypto, it's like at a trillion dollars, Bitcoin alone. It's obvious that all of this innovation in the financial system, you know, even just basic things like speed of settlement, right? Or the fact that you have cryptographically protected wallets, so the custody is local rather than all being centralized. All of these kinds of things, you know, are some are obvious, some are non-obvious innovations. All those things are being held back. And, you know, if you think about, you know, my friend Alex Rampell is a partner at A6NZ, he pointed out that I think, you know, they got from, they got to T plus three settlement in the late nineties. And then they got to like T plus two in like, you know, 2017 or something like that. And he's like plus 17 years between every T, you know, every time step, I forget the exact dates, but something along those lines. And that's the glacial pace at which the existing system was moving. But within Ethereum, you settle in minutes and have done so for more than five years now. It's been operating 24-7. And that works in any country in the world. It works programmatically for pretty much any amount, modulo fees, and they're working on scaling. And that's like 10x better on several different dimensions when you can build something new rather than just be forced to reform the system. So a lot of people who say, oh, I want to reform the system, et cetera, they're only doing so because they don't actually have the option of creating a new one. And opening up that option is important for another reason as well, which is if you think about you know, Microsoft, the only way that Satya Nadella was able to gain the political capital to truly reform them from the inside was to show that Google and Apple and Facebook and Amazon had massively succeeded by doing things that Microsoft wasn't or couldn't do. You know, and so eventually after he took over, he could point to their massive undeniable successes in markets that Microsoft used to be dominant in to say, hey, let's do open source. How about cloud? Maybe we should be multi-device rather than try to force everything on Windows. And so on and so forth. There were like many deeply baked assumptions that had got Microsoft to where they were, that were now holding Microsoft back sure. that couldn't be overturned without the example to show that that wouldn't lead to doom, but rather to great success. And in fact, staying intransigent and staying hooked on the past was was going to lead to doom, right? Now, a reformer like Satya wouldn't even be able to come along without those external examples. The thing would just go into the ground. 
one of the last things you said was the only reason that you you try to reform what you have is because you can't start something new. But I would actually say that there there's very little cost to leaving Microsoft and starting a new company. If you get it wrong, the worst thing that happens is you lost your job. But starting a new country, the costs of that are enormous. And I think this brings us back to the question of values and power. Uh, wait, wait, let me pause there. Yeah. Right now, the cost is enormous. No, no, I don't mean because financially. I mean the cost of getting it wrong. I actually think that reducing that downside is a big part of the concept of the network state. Okay, so right now, when people think about starting a new country, they think about something really grand and majestic, like winning a revolution or an election or a war or something crazy like that, right? And, and those are like the historical ways that people think of starting a new country, right? Isn't that the only way you do it? And then there's more recent ways, which are like, you know, like I'll give some of the crazier ways, like micronations, you know, oh, let me go and set up a platform in, in, in sea land. You know, if yeah, like Peter Thiel, that, for right? example, seasteading. Yeah, or, or, or seasteading, right? So that's like another one. Or like space, right? Can we get to outer space and can we do something there, right? So like the three conventional ways to start a new country are election, revolution, and war. And the three well-known unconventional ways are like micronation, seasteading, and space, right? And I think I've got a seventh way, which is what I call a cloud country. And so the idea is that the community exists in the cloud and you have a social network with virtual currency and virtual reality. So most of what you're building is actually online at first. And then you buy territory offline, but not in one single place. As I mentioned, you, you have a cul-de-sac here, you have an apartment here, you have a ranch here, you have maybe a small town here. And those are physical projections or tendrils, just like Google has offices all around the world, but the thing still lives online. And what I described just now has no upper limit to its scale. You know, how many warehouses does Amazon have, right? How many offices does Google have? Quite a lot. Amazon has like more than a million people under Bezos, right? Or actually Bezos is retiring now, but used to, right? So that's something where you're not winning a war, you're not winning an election, you're not winning a revolution, you're not even making a big deal out of it. You just have a million people who have opted in to be governed in this way, to pool their resources, to work together in this community. It's like a large social network in some ways, just much, much more serious. And you know, you can think of it as, I mean, it's kind of like the communes that arose in the 1800s in the US, like the Oneida commune or, or various folks who went out into the Midwest. And some of those were actually quite successful. Some of them, like the kibbutzes, basically became like profitable businesses where they specialized in doing things that others you know, weren't good at. Others, of course, failed. They were Luddite communities, though. This is actually Not all an, them. an inversion. Not of all of them. Yeah, like Netafim, for example, like is a kibbutz that's absolutely not Luddite. It's like a world leader in agricultural innovation. You know, people think, yeah, you, yeah, you can have the Amish, which go backwards how, in time, but you could have, go ahead. How does the Israeli society and Israel share in their profits in a way that is comparable to the rest of the country? In other words, how does the nation state itself benefit from that type of organization? Well, I mean, you know, render under Caesar what is Caesar's, right? If you're in Rome, do as Romans do. Like, you know, the point here is to work- but so Just to be clear, what I'm trying to figure out is, are we talking about a confederacy type structure where the-, the uh... We're talking about a transnational entity that has a sense of purpose and self and negotiates more freedom over time using the fact that they're mobile- using the fact that they're global, using the fact, and this is critical. I just don't you know why the, 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 the thing is, what I'm trying to understand is why would these nation states be down for that? Like the oh, US- because the US- Because the, because the, the financial stands, gain. Well, uh, several things. First is cryptocurrency means you have property the state can't easily seize. But why can't the state easily seize Bitcoin? Okay, I'll go into that. Let me go into that. So several things. First is, you know, you need 12 words for- to represent an arbitrary amount of Bitcoin. It's not like gold where you need like a truck to represent, you know, to carry hundreds of millions of dollars and it's heavy. It's not like that. You can actually store it on a hard drive. You can store it on a text file. You can store it in lots of different ways, right? Bitcoin, of course, is, you know, 2008, 2009 vintage. Um, there's newer things like Zcash and more private coins that are, you know, even more private, right? Sure. Number one. Number two is, it is an international phenomenon. It's available in every single country, right? Number three is to shut off 
you know, even if you manage to shut down the Bitcoin network, you can't delete all the ledgers. You have this ledger that's backed up maybe the most replicated data structure in the world. You also can't unwind- What's the value of that backup if the network can no longer process transactions? Because you can import it into other ledgers. For example, WBTC or RenBTC are ways to import the Bitcoin ledger or piece of it into Ethereum. Like if by some you know, extreme circumstance, the Bitcoin protocol ever had a flaw or was shut down, the ledger can be imported into one of a hundred other cryptocurrencies that have different consensus mechanisms. Yes, it would be a Tower of Babel moment. Yes, it would mean that the value of crypto would be split into 50 pieces. But the point is that cryptocurrency as a concept will never vanish from the earth. Yeah. I mean, as a concept, that's a. I think I could probably go on board with that. Because there's proof of stake, there's, you know, there's- Okay, there's, it's an interesting, because that's another thing. Like, I don't know that proof of work can operate at scale in the type of environment we're describing. And I mean, certainly I, to begin with, the very least sort of lowest hanging fruit is that I question whether you can get rid of the, the block reward. But even proof of work itself seems like something that ultimately if Bitcoin, it seems that the, the, the real strategy for Bitcoin is to become adopted by those in political power so that it becomes an effect too big to fail politically. And then they would simply change the consensus mechanism to something that's more sustainable, both energetically, but also security wise. Well, so actually I made some points like this in my most recent blog post, actually pinned to the top of my Twitter, how India legalizes crypto. Or I make the point that Bitcoin can't be banned for technical, social, and political reasons. And the technical reasons are some of the ones I just went into. Like, you know, to truly shut down crypto, people really haven't thought this through. It's engineered to be very difficult to do that. Since not only do you have to, you can't just like shut down the internet for a day because that doesn't delete the hard drives. And that just means that the rest of the world is engaging in crypto transactions. You'd have to like de-gauss or electromagnetic pulse lots of hard drives. You have to cut off all communication with the country so people can't get 12 words in or out including phone calls. You have to stop all immigration and emigration. And the thing about that is that's just not possible. I just described as too much of a- you, you, Maybe you to cannot... kill entirely, but you can expend a very small amount of money, energy, et cetera, to make something practically unusable. Well, so I don't think so because this would basically be like a replay of what happened with the RIA, where the RIA went, this is much lower stakes, but 20 years ago they went and yeah, they were able to get Napster to go out of business and Kazaa to go out of business, but they weren't able to stop BitTorrent or the Pirate Bay because they were in jurisdictions that were just simply less sympathetic to the RIA, number one. And there were technologies like magnet links and sure. actually quite, you know, Kademlia distributed hash tables and so on that were invented yeah. that started to make it harder and harder for them to go and attack, number one. Number two, they spent down a ton of their reputational capital by suing their own customers because the more you coerce, the less you can coerce, basically, mm -hmm. you know, like they just spent down reputation. And eventually the existence of BitTorrent, which is still around and still people still use it, led them to actually make an honest man, you know, of, of themselves and work with iTunes and Spotify to offer what people actually wanted, which was streaming. But right? then the question is, what do people actually want when they own Bitcoin? Because with streaming music, you were able to get something that you couldn't get without it. In the case of Bitcoin, you have existing payment networks work much better than Bitcoin. Ah, Bitcoin do they? What no, is not it? for not for so let me let's, let me push back on that. Right. So there's Bitcoin, but there's also Ethereum and there's USDC and there's other kinds of things, right? You know, cryptocurrency is good for those transactions that are very large, very small, very fast, very automated, very international, or very transparent. Okay. If you have something which is, let's say, two or more of those characteristics you'd find it very difficult to do with the traditional financial systems. Let me give an example of something which does fit in the traditional financial system. That's buying a coffee at Starbucks. Everybody comes back to this because it's a very frequent purchase. That's neither very large nor very small. It's like mezzanine, like a few bucks. It's not very automated because you're just swiping your card. It's not international because you and the person are, are right there. It doesn't have to be very transparent. You don't need to see the receipt on chain, right? So none of those criteria apply, right? However, if you are, let's say, doing a crowdfund like the Brave ICO, you know, several years ago, you're taking lots of payments from overseas, some very large, some like a million bucks, some like a thousand bucks. So very large, very international. They're automatically going into a smart contract. 
It's very transparent because everybody can see because it's like people from Japan and Brazil and Nigeria and you know the Philippines, et cetera, are all sending money in. They don't know you, but they're seeing the smart contracts. It's very transparent. And then you are sending them back like uh, effectively a stock certificate, which is like the, or not a stock certificate because it's not equity, but something similar to that, which is a stake in this new network, a token. And um, it's distinct. It's something which has a utility to it. So in that sense, it's actually very different than traditional certificate. But it also is something where there's a capital investment aspect where people are sending money in and they are getting a, you know, a digital token out. So it blurs boundaries and it shouldn't be regulated in like wh- the old why way. Why is it better to do it that way as opposed to, well, why would it be better to raise money in Bitcoin than to raise it, let's say, through a normal payment processor? Well, so, 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 I mean, Bitcoin is good. I think crypto, I would say, is just generally better than normal payment processor because it's international, right? Anybody can send in. So it's truly global equality of opportunity. Someone isn't boxed out. If you try to receive 100 wires from 100 different countries in 100 different amounts, that's not going to settle and be liquid for you within 35 seconds. Sure. Right? But it is on chain. And let me give you a concrete example of why that's valuable, right? With Earn.com, the business uh, that we sold to Coinbase, I would take in, we would take in an Ethereum transaction or Bitcoin transaction from somebody, let's say from Canada or from Greece or what have you, okay, for $10,000 worth, okay? Mm -hmm. And I would just, you know, be on the phone with them and I'd see it refresh, I'd see it on either scan. And, you know, because while you're on the phone, you can just wait. Boom, you see on either scan, great, we have received the funds. And then we hit the button to send an email out to a thousand people, paying them each 10 bucks to complete a task. You know, for example, review that person's app, right? Or, you know, like go and, you know, like fill out a survey, something like that, right? And, you know, say review like a user testing kind of thing. You download the app, go through it, fill out a survey, get back the results, okay? And that goes out to a thousand people in you know, 40 different countries and they each get $10 of cryptocurrency and they return back their survey results or their user testing within basically an hour. And that comes back to the user, right? Now think about that. If they had sent a traditional wire, it would have taken, I don't know, two to three days to clear, right? Or we would have had to extend them credit, right? Mm -hmm. And in terms of paying, a thousand people in, in 50 different countries, 10 bucks and settling it within seconds, forget it. You can't wire money that's that small to that many people in that many different places, right? Mm-hmm. Your account gets frozen, their account gets frozen, the wire transfer fees are too much, SWIFT would take too long, they're not going to put back a survey, etc. right? So you start to actually see what the changes in the metabolism of business is like the difference in going from a postal mail where you send it and you have to wait two to three days for a receipt to an electronic mail where you can actually have a real-time conversation back and forth. And once that metabolism changes, well, you go from email to instant message to Facebook and Twitter and group instant message. And each step is like an obvious step, like from physical mail to email, from email to group email, from group email to a Facebook thread. But then you start thinking about how would I do a Facebook thread with physical mail? And you'd have to send like a stamped envelope to a thousand friends. You'd get back a comment from three of them. They would include a photo. You'd have to copy that photo and send it back out to a thousand friends. Just think about the costs associated with that broadcast, scatter, gather. It would just never happen, right? It's like you know, thousands of dollars for the equivalent of a Facebook comment thread using the technology from 30 years ago. And so crypto completely modernizes every single aspect of finance. I mean, it's insane how many different levels it touches from settlement to the amount that you can send to the programs you can write with it, et cetera. But also the the question is, what is the quality of that settlement if you are doing it instantaneously? I guess guess that's a question. The question has to do with- You're talking about finality. You're talking about finality. Well, I'm talking about finality and I'm talking about the way in which you reach finality and how secure that finality is based sure. on a different so, protocol. I mean, yeah. So, you know, if, if you want to be more rigorous about it, in theory, the time before you should spend is a function of how much money you've received and the like the theoretical cost for an attacker, right? Right. Because if you've received a billion dollars, then, you know, an attacker might 
see that on chain and go and rent a hundred million dollars of hash power to try to unwind and steal your money or something. In theory, this is possible. In practice, I haven't seen that happen on the big chains. It could happen on smaller chains, but the way to rectify that is to simply either send smaller amounts or to have a longer finality well, time. But I'm also suggesting that sending smaller, if we're, at least we're talking about the Bitcoin network, sending smaller amounts doesn't work, it's just too expensive. Yeah, 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 sure. So, I mean, the thing is, I'm not and that- It's expensive I, because it's meant to be more final, but it's not final, well, but it's meant to be more secure. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, uh, look, I'm a huge fan of BTC and Bitcoin, but I don't get hung up on its technological limitations because there's so much innovation going on in crypto. So BTC is like digital gold, and it may turn out that like you move it about as frequently as gold, and you do like one giant transaction of $10 million dollars to set up the equivalent of WBTC or REN BTC on another chain. And then you can send like fractions of a cent on that chain. But if very... that's the case, then at such a scale that you're describing where you have second layer solutions that are basically yeah. facilitating almost every single transaction, what's going to provide the income to the miners to sustain the network at the base layer to keep oh, it secure? Well, because, you know, like the the value of an on-chain transaction for Bitcoin, it will be packed, right? It'll be like this incredibly high demand thing. And you know what you can do, for example- what do you mean? But it, why would it be high demand if people aren't using the base layer since they're all using secondary layers or tertiary layers? Because, I mean, you still need to send a transaction. In order to move BTC, you're still going to have some layer one transactions. But, and there's going to be they, enough of them. But if they become less often as a result of the fact that People are- no, what will happen is they just become like totally saturated. And so people do move as much as they can off on L2, but they, it's like expensive to move gold. It, it'll be expensive to move digital gold. Right. Well, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is if I follow your logic correctly, you're just simply saying that as transaction volume on the base layer decreases, the price of each transaction increases. So what I'm suggesting- what I'm No, no, no. Suggest- I'm not saying that. I'm not, oh. saying, I'm not saying the volume. So what I'm saying is- and we're talking about a uh, world without a block reward too, or yeah. a diminishing block reward like we're moving so, into. So, yeah, Whether yeah, you have so the block reward or not, the, the, the block reward is diminished substantially. Two different pieces. Number one, I don't think demand for L1 transactions drops. I think it keeps increasing. Mm-hmm. What happens is that anything that is below that threshold of economically feasible gets pushed off into L2. But the queue for L1 transactions just keeps increasing. Okay. Okay, because because the overall adoption of the network grows. Yeah, exactly. We're still we're, I mean, we're at 100 million crypto users, or, but it'll be a billion. Will it scale perfectly? We don't know. It may be something where you have to move $100 billion of Bitcoin over to something like WBTC or RenBTC and then use it wrapped. there. Yeah, so, wrapped on Ethereum. Yeah, you so might have to wrap. Here. Yeah, exactly. But, but to your second point on the block reward, the thing is, I don't. Even, the reason I don't care about that that much is because for the block reward to ever really wear out, you would have to have prices less than 2x every four years. And they'd be way ahead of that, number one. That's at least to keep constant, right? Number two is fees are increasing as well quickly, you know, due to all this demand for there. Number three is like, if you think about what you might have, for example, a possible outcome is Bitcoin is the king of coins and every other chain wants to hash its chain state to this extremely scarce proof of work space. And so, you know, every block, they put up a hash, right? And say, buy, you know, whatever number of hashes per day, you know, because there's about like six per hour, 144 per day on average. And you're basically paying a fee to Bitcoin to hash your chain. And it's like, they all pay tribute to the king of coins, right? Yeah, it becomes Uh, the global settlement layer for all the other settlement layers is your point. Yeah, exactly. That's right. This is one possibility, right? There's another possibility, which is you can do something clever with like atomic swaps and so on, where the money stays immobile on BTC and you don't have on-chain transactions. But basically, there'll be a thousand different workarounds to try to minimize on-chain transactions. And as I said, the fact that REN BTC and other kinds of things like that exist and that there's a lot of interesting work with roll-ups and whatnot, I'm not concerned about blockchain scalability. This is sort of like in the late 90s, early 2000s, when people were concerned about internet scalability. I think there's so many overlapping different things that can work for this without getting super technical. And a lot of them work in different ways that they they have a synergistic effect. But that's one side of the coin, the technological side of the coin. And part of the technological choices and trade-offs are made in light with security in mind. And that brings us then to the question of nation states again, which is, for example, you have an authoritarian country like China, 
a country of 1.3 billion people that's going to be launching its the DCEP, a digital national yep. currency. Yep. And now I'm not, I don't put myself out as an expert on China, but we have done so many episodes on China on this show, on the CCP and the political system and the economy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I do not see a scenario in which the Chinese would be willing to allow Bitcoin transactions and Bitcoin in any way to, to function, to have an economically important role within its domestic boundary. And I feel like if anything, the Chinese would be more than happy to allow Western countries to adopt Bitcoin as much as possible because they're in a position to disrupt the network to their advantage. They basically launch a digital currency, try to get the world to adopt it. And if the West is willing to stay on a proof of work digital currency like Bitcoin, which currently has 60% or so mining capacity in or hash rate in China, China's in position to disrupt Western financial systems. So a couple of thoughts on that. One sure. is it will be interesting to see what happens with Chinese mining. China has actually been trying to push miners out of the country for several years. And so that's why folks have been setting up shop elsewhere. There's a lot. I mean, crypto is actually very popular in China. They are into digital currency. Millions and millions of Chinese people hold cryptocurrency. Some of them use VPNs and so on, but it is very well known, very well adopted. And the thing about it is it's been going through the roof, right? So it's been creating all of these new millionaires and soon billionaires. And those are folks who have clout as well, right? And so it's not going to be quite as simple as, oh, just ban it and it goes away. Lots of folks will, first of all, it, they'd only ban it for China. And that ban would be something which is like the ban of 2017, where everybody still holds cryptocurrency and so on and so forth. I think that what is the most realistic scenario that would happen, China is actually the one country which because it's got the Great Firewall and because it's had the reputation of being just totally ruthless on this kind of thing, here's what I think they could do. They would still wouldn't stop it, but this is a possible scenario, right? The possible scenario is they use the firewall to go after port 8333, which is a Bitcoin yep. port, right? Mm -hmm. or, or other cryptocurrency ports. Okay. So then the developers respond by doing port randomization. All right. Now, the, the Chinese firewall guys are prepared for this, and they look, and they're like, okay, it's among these ports. We're going to do deep packet inspection. We're going to see which port this is being sent on. Okay, so now the developers try to do tunneling, you know, send it over SSH, make it look like HTTPS or something like that. And this goes back and forth, and, you know, I'm not sure exactly where it lands up because one of the things is that it's not a lot of bandwidth here in the sense of, you're not talking about streaming video per se, right? There is a latency requirement in terms of people being able to see what's on chain, but you can get around that by, you know, having a, a more lenient approach towards finality and, and listening on a bunch of other nodes. So point being that what they could do is they could maybe set up a peekaboo scenario where the Chinese chain starts extending because miners can't see the rest of the world and the mining's in China, but the transactions are happening outside of China. Okay, so you have a peekaboo problem where the Chinese chain extends and then the rest of the world chain also extends and then periodically they see each other. And then and they, the, sync up. they sync up and all the blocks that remind the rest of the world are thrown away because the Chinese chain is longer, right? So. Now, one way of dealing with this is, as I said, you require more block confirmations, you know, significantly more than six. I don't know, you'd have to work out the math, but basically it's also an empirical thing in terms of how long periodically do those sync ups happen, and then you don't want any transaction to be reversed, right? Fundamentally, the thing is that this is the one assumption which Bitcoin does have, which other currencies will need to work around, which is Bitcoin assumes a global network. Right, so it is not set up for indefinite partition tolerance. Okay, indefinite partition tolerance means the network is partitioned with no recipe or timeline yep. for when it will, you know, come yep. back together and every node will see every other node. Right? Okay, so in such a situation, you'd probably have a fork of Bitcoin, and uh, what would happen is it would not no longer be the heaviest chain because the mining was in China. Instead, there would be something where the non-Chinese miners would have to put digital signatures or something similar into the blocks that they were mining so that people could determine which chain it was, right? So that is actually not proof of work anymore. That is because it's not- You've the, centralized the, the mining. 
You have partially introduced a trust component into the mining, yeah. right? Okay. What are the ways around this? Several ways around this. Again, I'm being very technical, so your audience may or may not care about this stuff. One promising way is ProgPow. So ProgPow is pretty interesting because it says, all right, mining will always specialize in ASICs. Make those ASICs GPUs because GPUs have an adoption envelope that's above that of cryptocurrency since they're used for everything else, like graphics and other things, right? And so design your mining algorithm to give a workout to GPUs such that you'd have to advance the state of GPUs and beat NVIDIA in order to build a better mining chip. So I think ProgPow is very interesting as a, a new kind of hash function that is GPU-based because it would, in theory, re-decentralize mining since ASICs would no longer work for mining and you would instead be able to use all these computers around the world because Satoshi hadn't really thought about the idea of concentrated mining farms because mm -hmm. he had wanted it to be distributed. Yeah. So one model is ProgPow, which I think is very promising. Another is proof of stake, where in the event this China chain thing happens, I mean, the, the one major advantage of proof of work is if you have a number of different chains competing for your attention, like a Hydra, you don't have to trust anybody else to figure out which the, the heaviest proof of work chain is. Mm -hmm. You can download each of them and basically just look, you know, you cryptographically verify and you just run it all the way back and you figure out, okay, which one has all the correct solutions and which one to first order has the most leading zeros in, mm -hmm. in each of the blocks, right? And that's actually the heaviest proof of work chain, right? I mean, you have to do more calculations that, but that to first order. Proof of stake isn't like that because you can't just on your own determine what the leading chain is. There's a degree of trust in terms of having somebody point out to you what the longest chain is because the stake process doesn't involve computation. It's not burning any energy. It's just people, quote, voting, right? So it is possible. You need to have somebody tell you, oh, that's the Ethereum chain, right? Now, a lot of people could tell you that. You could triangulate on that from a number of different axes. You can argue over whether that's a huge requirement or not, but this is another approach where you you know the first approach prog pow you'd use decentral a more decentralized proof of work with GPUs the second approach you get rid of entirely and you go with a proof of stake approach right anyway we're getting down into the weeds but this stuff will be important you know it's going to mm -hmm. be stuff which is like uh, you know in 2021 everybody cares about politicians tweeting or retweeting or liking or 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 replying or whatever to somebody and that was like this arcane thing that only tech people cared about 13 years ago right? Crypto will be like that. All of these crazy details that we're talking about today, in five years or 10 years, every head of state will care about this because mm. to be a head of state, you'll have to be head of network. So much more I can say, by the way, <sighs> I, I'm, I am getting a little I, tired. I, I don't yeah. want, listen, this was awesome. I could talk to you forever. I wonder if you'd be, I mean, I, I, I guess I would put it this way. I, I have, I've had so many interesting guests on the program and I have so many more interesting ones coming up. I think it would be really cool to try to put together a clubhouse event where maybe I was able to bring on a, a Peter Zihan or a John Mearsheimer, the realist, and maybe also a Mariana Mazzucato or a, a Bill Janeway and try to do some really, an really interesting talk where we really kind of take people that have really thought about these things in depth with different points of view and kind of, you know what I mean? I mean, I would do yeah. it in the real world if this wasn't freaking COVID. That would yeah, be exciting. So, so, you know, the thing is that basically, I think that with, you know, Peter Zion or Marianne Moscato, I mean, I really disagree with them on a yeah. lot of things. Yeah. So. Well, maybe, yeah, I mean, I just threw it out there. I mean, it's not. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, I, 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 like, I don't mind debating with somebody who, you know, is, is a very different opinion. I, I, I'm just not sure. Like, maybe maybe a written thing might be better for no one to get a mad what? or whatever. A W-R-I-T-T-E-N, like written. Like just like like essay back and forth might be oh better written for, written written yeah for, yeah for not to well get you're mad. you're very but you're very um, congenial interlocutor that's true I think I like to think so but yeah but you know okay so for example let me, let's yeah. talk about Zihan just for a second yep. right so I mentioned you know one of his arguments is that demographics is important I think robotics is more important than demographics another argument is that. You know, location. The U.S. Matters. military and Navy and patrolling sea routes is important. Yeah, U.S. military and Navy patrolling sea routes. And so, yes, I do think that the U.S. will remain a military power in the sort of brute force way for a while. But I think that a better model conceptually for the U.S. is more like, you know, post Soviet Russia, right? Like basically post dollar collapse America will be like post Soviet Russia. Well, that's not very is, uh, encouraging. 
Yeah. So it's like, you know, this former global ideological empire that still is armed to the teeth in certain ways that has abandoned all of its military bases abroad. And that, you know, like in the same way that Russia blames the U.S. for its fall, the U.S. will probably blame China because they'll probably date it back to COVID and and so on. I, and sometimes a lot of this stuff is a delayed reaction, like Occupy Wall Street happened in like 2011, which was three years yeah. after the financial crisis. I kind of think, unfortunately, I think the war drums will beat after everybody gets vaccinated and then people want to settle a score with China or something like that. I feel like that's a subplot which will build by the mid 2020s, unfortunately. Uh-huh. Go ahead. No, it's this is interesting because we uh, you challenge so many of the positions that I've come to hold thoughtfully. I'd like to think that I haven't come to these views by adopting someone else's position. You know, I've done a lot of episodes on this stuff, but it, it's valuable to me to talk with someone that is, I think, such a... It isn't just that you you have interesting ideas. You also are very good at discussing them. You're civilized, you know? And anyway, I well, just thought... Well, thank you. It just yeah. in, my, in my mind, I just thought, you know, it would be an interesting panel to put together. And I'm a very... I think I like to think also of myself as a very good debater, moderator rather, and someone who does a... really makes an effort to ensure that uh, people are getting the right amount of time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But... Totally. And I'm definitely, I'm not saying I won't consider it. I definitely will, will think about it. But let me, let me actually just finish the, my, yeah. my Zion and then I want to, and then I want to give yeah. you your, your evening because I know you got to wake up. Totally, totally. Yeah. And so, and again, not to beat up on, on Zion or anything, but just what I disagree with A, robotics over demographics. B, you know, I think the US military in many ways, and this is a kind of, this is maybe an out of the money prediction, I think it's a paper tiger. So why do I say that? It's because, so, well, COVID was a military defeat. Right. If you have a biodefense strategy that's at defense.gov that says you're going to combat man-made natural threats and you've had anthrax and you've had years and years and years of biodefense appropriations and you know talking about WMD with nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons, and that's been mm-hmm. this primary thing of U.S. national security for more than a decade and what you fought a war over, blah, blah, blah. It was a military defeat. And basically, to my knowledge, you know, the military... The most public thing the military saw, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but the most public thing I saw the military do was set up folding chairs in the Javits Center, you know, which was palliative. It wasn't the superhero, you know, movie, Captain America, secret plan to vaccinate everybody thing. You know, there was a DARPA program to like do fast vaccination. And, you know, I'm not sure what what came of that, right? Again, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically look like a military defeat because these seas, these oceans, these aircraft carriers, et cetera, the virus bypassed all of them. And the thing about it is it couldn't be bombed. It can't be regulated. You can't freeze its bank account. You can't demoralize it with press coverage. All the typical weapons of the you know American state, this thing just bypassed everything, right? Yeah. Now, again, I'm not saying it's a bioweapon. I am saying, however, that the US military versus something like that is a Maginot line. And I'm also saying that every adversary who saw that is, you know, like there's probably somebody out there who might cook up a bioweapon as a function of that. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. At least it's something to contemplate, right? I'm not saying it's 100%. It's pretty dangerous because it would hit them as well. But if they had a vaccine and they cooked up a bioweapon and they can see just how bad the U.S. is at dealing with this, this is the way, you know, like that you could like really hit the U.S., right? So- I mean, I'm not saying that is uh, like is 100 percent, you know, or whatever. I'm just saying that 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 you know, if you're a military planner, you'd want to think about that scenario, sure. right? Okay. So the military, I think, is very overhyped in terms of its you know role there, especially because execution in the physical world, like you know, China was able to build a hospital in like 10 days. Yeah. And it's not just that hospital. I know people say, oh, that's propaganda. Like they built out their whole country. If you've seen the before and after, you can't fake Shanghai, right? It exists. Sure. And you compare that to San Francisco, where it takes basically years to dig up 4th Street, and China can build a train station in nine days, right? Yeah. Now, there's a lot of COPE, C-O-P-E, which says, oh, they can only do it because they're authoritarian, blah, blah, blah. And that is certainly part of it. But the U.S.'s state capacity has just been falling off a cliff. And here's the issue. If... In a life and death situation like COVID, China can build a hospital in 10 days and the U.S. cannot execute like that in the physical world, almost certainly in a physical conflict, China will be inside America's OODA loop. The irony here is that 
China is a much stronger state, right? I mean, yeah, this is the irony. Sure. It's like you're making the case for a more authoritarian government. No, I'm not really. I'm not even making a case for China because I think that actually as these two forces fight, like woke, increasingly woke America, woke capital versus communist capital, you know, the rest of the world, I think, is going to go to crypto capital. And just like the first and the second and the third world during the Cold War, you know. But they're going to have to align with a physical state. And by the way, this happened 100 years ago where a, a new class of American elites who were the offspring of the robber barons became internationalists. And they were, many of those people funded fascist Italy. They funded the Nazis in Germany. They need, they're not going to just pour their money into the cloud. They've got to pour it into a country. Not necessarily. Because, I mean, here's the thing, you know, imagine if the billions wasted on San Francisco real estate was building out virtual reality. But you know this, though, like information resides in the physical world. Sure, but you can replicate it. That's the point of, you know, like decentralized. Uh, to be clear, I'm not saying everything is digital all the time. Instead, what I'm saying is something a little more subtle, which is the physical is still valuable, but it's a premium product. Everything is digital primary and only the most important things get printed out. But digital most primary... They also kind of not, you need the hardware to run the software. Well, well, let me explain what I mean when I say that the digital is now primary and the physical is secondary for many kinds of things, right? So a newspaper, it used to be that the physical paper was primary and a few articles were online. Now today, the website is primary and many of the graphics can only be produced online and the physical printout is secondary and an afterthought. People don't even necessarily get the physical paper anymore, right? And I think that 2020 was the year that it flipped and the internet became primary in many other areas. That is to say, many relationships begin internet first and only materialize in the physical world if they're high enough value. Conferences will be clubhouse first, for example, online first, and only in person if they're a very high value. And so it's not that physical ceases to be valuable. Of course, it's valuable, but it becomes a premium product, right? Companies start online and it's all remote and they only get co-located if they become valuable enough to be able to afford it. So you, you, for example, you assemble a million people online, right? In these network states and maybe like 900,000 of them might just stay in their current apartments. And then, you know, a hundred thousand of them, you know, like are in groups of, you know, 1, 10, 50, 100, et cetera, in larger and larger clumps around the world. You have like a power law kind of thing where the most simplest thing is to first declare yourself mentally to be part of that group. And there's like a funnel where you move towards, okay, I am, you know, in this apartment in Berlin. I am, you know, in a house in, you know, Mexico but this is my community. These are the people who I really vibe with. They believe in the same thing that I do, right? And then you hang out more and more there virtually. And then eventually you might clump up with three other people in that location and you get a group house together, right? Or 20 other people and you get a cul-de-sac or you move to another country to join like one of those locations, right? And this fashion, digital primary, physical secondary. You know, I think where you and I are maybe we're disagreeing, we're bumping up against a, a disagreement about perception here is, a perceptual disagreement is that, or understanding. Ultimately, I, I think a realist view of international relations, and I think that actually applies here as well to this discussion. And I feel like a lot of the assumptions you make, or a lot of your reasoned analysis and inductive reasoning, ultimately depends on the assumption that there is some supranational security state or something, not, not con that you do it consciously, but at some point power has to get involved here. Because I think human beings have always been violent and I don't see why any of that would change. I mean, people are still going to try and exert well, force and coercive sure. energy. So several thoughts on that. One is, so I'll give you three or four different arguments on this point. One, okay, I've, thought, I've thought about this a bit, right? <laughs> so- so the, uh, we've tried to wrap this up so many times, and yeah. yeah. So I, 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 let me see. Let me see if I can, you know, if I, I can, <laughs> I can wrap this up. But basically, so on the topic of violence, first, encryption is a way of protecting property rights without violence, right? So the less physical stuff you have, the more digital stuff you have, the harder it is to steal. Unless you do a wrench attack. Yeah, but to do a wrench attack, you need to find the person physically. 
And so I think that by 2050 or thereabouts, doxing will be the ultimate crime. Because if you know somebody's XY location, you can send in the drones. Interesting. Right. And so because people just won't have physical relationships? No, they will, but it'll just be like, you know. Because then you can wrench attack the people you know. Well, the whole thing about a wrench attack is it requires you to know where that person is and be able to go there with force and be able to enter that region and so on and so forth, right? And what I think happens, I've got a talk on the pseudonymous economy where I think that what we just did is we just like uploaded the real world to the internet in unencrypted form. Hey, everybody use your global identifiers, your quote, real names, all connect to each other, et cetera. But real names are actually a technology in their own right. A better term for them might be social security name or state assigned name. It's not like it's in your DNA, Mm -hmm. right? It's literally a global identifier that we assign a lot of significance to, but that is itself a social construct. And the alternative to real names would be quote, pseudonyms that, you know, you just set up a new account on Reddit, or you are whoever you want to be when you go into a new town online. Right? Mm-hmm. This is how it used to be. Rather than a single global identifier where everything could be tracked and mapped together, you had a pseudonym for each thing. The problem is with real names online today, you know, real names basically allow people to join 30 different databases on you. Right. And you know what another name for a another word for a name is a handle. And imagine like a handle to like a file cabinet being pulled out with your name on it. Right. Mm-hmm. And so real names are actually a huge security risk. And I think that people already, the young kids are starting to do it, you know, but actually 400 million people on Reddit use pseudonyms. I think pseudonymity is this massively underappreciated thing. And we've been able to do pseudonymous transactions, uh, communications rather, but crypto allows us to do pseudonymous transactions. And so I think that the truce on the other end of this, you know, 30 year internet war that we're getting into, right, we're hmm. already in, in the middle of the piece of Westphalia among other pieces of the piece of Westphalia equivalent is the pseudonymous economy, where with a pseudonym, that combats both discrimination and cancellation. It's not great, but it's acceptable to enough folks on both on all sides of any conflict that it actually erects a defense. And it means in particular that, you know, like um, imagine you have hierarchies of pseudonyms, just like an HD wallet in crypto, right? You have this address and then you have addresses under that address and addresses under that address. So a compromise doesn't hit the whole thing, right? So you have pseudonyms and then pseudonyms under pseudonyms and you separate out your earning name, your speaking name and your real name, right? And probably have multiple speaking names and multiple real names and you have like an identity management thing. And very few people, if any, right, need to know that the physical person maps to a particular digital identity. Maybe you tell your wife, right? You know, but, or like, you know, you don't probably tell your password to anybody, right? You don't tell your private keys to anybody. So you basically secure the physical person by not having that mapping and you have that as encrypted as possible. I wonder at this point in such a world, how secure your mind becomes to being hacked. And sure. So no, crazy things you know can happen, but basically, <sighs> in that in that kind of world, you basically want to have minimum physical consumption. A lot of the status games move online, right? For example, the clothing industry. I think a, a big chunk of it is going to become the virtual clothing industry, where you have NFTs and and this type of stuff. It's like designer items and video games, um, because I mean, if you think about it, here's one way of putting it, right? How much, what percentage of your waking hours do you spend looking at a screen? Oh, an enormous number. An enormous number, right? So you already are spending most of your life in the matrix. In many ways, yes. I mean, not just in right? this, on through the screen, but there are different layers of the matrix. Yeah, I agree. We're living in it. Right. We're swimming in it. And so with, with VR, with AR and so on, that's going to become, with Neuralink, you know, those kinds of things, that's going to become even more of a thing, right? Yeah. And so that's what I mean by digital primary, physical secondary. Yeah. This is the long arc to bet on. Yeah, I, right? see, I see what you're saying. And so if that's the case, then you really want to think about, okay, what is dominant in the digital environment? And it is encryption over coercion. And everything that you can set up as a battle between those, I've got all these examples in my book, but for example, you know, like the FBI wanted to go and surveil all these phones and end to end encryption thwarts them. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I'm not saying that the state, I'm not saying that violence doesn't exist and so on, but I think that a lot of people haven't thought through the details of it. And 
it's not that easy. It's kind of, you know, what it reminds me of is people are like, oh, I'm saying you, but people are like, oh, the government will just do X and Y. I'm like, the government can't send checks to people, right? Like like the U.S. government, currently, the big U.S. Currently, government. Currently. I, don't, I yeah. think we should also be, we should, we should be clear about that. The present dysfunctions aren't necessarily what we're going to see in the next five years, year two. It all depends. I mean, the, 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 the sure, U.S. can go sure. from being so, highly dysfunctional to highly functional given the right set of motivations. So what do I think about that? Um, I think I, I have over over my lifetime, over your lifetime, we have seen China and India and many other countries go from dysfunctional to functional. So absolutely, that is possible. But they hit bottom and tap the bottom for a long time, right? These great civilizations were humbled, you know, like India was, quote, a third world country, right? China people were eating each other. And other countries like Argentina used to be rich and have never recovered. They've just been, been basket cases that have gone through currency crisis after crisis. I think the thing I would say is, and this is maybe one of the most important like macro concepts I have is, you know, the most American thing in the world, I mean, America is a nation of immigrants, but that means it's also a nation of emigrants. And the most American thing in the world is to leave in search of a better life. And I think that if you go far enough west, you end up in the cloud. Okay, and I think that the internet is to the USA what the Americas were to the UK. Mm -hmm. It is a gigantic new world that will eventually give birth to what you're going to call them polities or societies or what have you that supplant the old. Right? As you go from common law to a constitution to smart contracts, you get more abstract, more powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, rather than you go from precedent to like a written constitution to smart contracts, which take the judge out of the equation and put it into a computer form, right? You go from the rights of all Englishmen to the rights of, you know, all Europeans and, and you know, all Americans to the entire world, right? You go from like 30 million, you know, less than 30 million British people, you know, it's, it was much less than that at that time, a 3 million, or I forget the number, to 300 million Americans to 3 billion people on, you know, let's say the, the free internet, right? And so that's the next step, I think. And internet culture is as American as American culture is British, which is to say it hails from it, but it really is Very its own thing. Yeah. Right? And I think that's going to become more obvious over the next few years once people realize that most of the people online today are not American. They may speak English, yeah. they may be in Twitter threads or Hacker News threads, but if you could see all the flags, they wouldn't actually be posting from the US or not US citizens, right? And so, as the US sort of fades, and the reason I say it fades is like COVID is a military defeat. Whether we want to like recognize it as such, it was one. And so, you know, like um, I think the economic defeat will probably come with the likely, I mean, obviously people will argue about this endlessly, but, and we'll see whether it actually happens. But I think it's quite likely that some form of inflation will hit. You know, who knows when? It's being punted on for a decade. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it is something where, Part of the reason it could hit is that Bitcoin is now ready. Crypto is now ready. The alternative is now ready. So you would actually have funds flow into harder currencies that can't be seized very easily. You know, And then you have the printing commence at the trillions of dollars. So that's the economic defeat on top of the military defeat. right? And both of these are very abstract. right? No one was invaded. Nothing was bombed or whatever. It's basically just like marginal lines, you know, things were bypassed. And this is why I like the, you know, just to just to close up on the Zahan thread, then we'll finish up. You know, Zahan, you know, the versus demographics, I think robotics, right? Versus like being super bullish on like the US military as this big force. I think it's just, it can beat up on people in the Middle East and Afghanistan that don't have an organized military, but I don't think it's faced like a peer competitor for a very long time. And given like the degree of physical mobilization that China can manage in a time of crisis versus what the US can manage. I'm not that sanguine on that. It's also something where you have, you know, there's all these signals, right? Like the, I think it was, was it the F-35, right? That had yep. these issues, yep. F-35 yep. Lightning. Yeah, exactly. And you have something where Intel is missing its tape outs. You have something where Boeing is screwing up. You have these flagship things in the US, right? Intel, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, that are just like on the things that they're supposed to be world dominant on are just like this, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, 
basically, if you think about the U.S. performance under COVID, only those institutions that are post-internet really did well, right? Only, only basically like you know, DoorDash and Zoom and so on and so forth. Those are things that did well, like the tech stuff that was new and those internet based. Those actually managed to keep society afloat, right? But restaurants, you know, were non-functional. The physical world basically failed, right? I mean, I don't know if that's true that the physical okay. world what, what, failed. What what worked in the physical world? Hospitals. Did they work? I mean, in the sense that like, you know, the- Yeah. So you're right that there are brave doctors and so on and so forth, right? But like, and, and you know, on the spectrum of things, did they fail as bad as public health failed? No, right? But it's sort of like, you know, the last line of defense. It's like saying, yeah, I got cut in my arm and, you know, my skin failed, but I've got like a- a wound there, and my my white blood cells responded, and what have you. That's like the last line of defense to get fi- you know these yeah. millions of infections and so on. Go ahead. I'm just wary of something that I think happens a lot, which is there's we sort of you know grand sweeping statements, and we we kind of wave off some of the details, which I think are actually relevant. Fair, fair. You know, your corrective is actually a good one, right? I'd say like of the various systems, I think you're right that hospitals. They remained functional, right? Yes, there were folks who were turned away because you know wings were devoted to COVID. There were times there were surges. You know, ER yeah, the police department were... also remained highly functional. The police departments around the country dealt with enormous amounts of political and social pushback, and they were able to operate within that environment. And we were able to have a civilized society. The levels of crime that have increased in New York are a fraction of what's possible in a lawless, you know, anarchic, Mad Max type failed state society. Well, so that's the thing is, if you grade it against Mad Max, yes, right? It's better than Mad Max. Yeah, it was an incremental increases. I mean, we, we still have an enor- a ridiculously secure country. Like New York City is insanely secure. So I, I argue that, okay, well, so San Francisco definitely is not. Um, I don't know if you'd agree San Francisco with that. Like, was never, <laughs> never very secure. Well, no, this, I, I was in San Francisco yeah. 20, I mean, I, 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 I lived in San Francisco the for West 20 Coast, years. For sure, the West Coast, I mean, Portland is a disaster. Yeah. I mean, that's, a, that's so, so, there's a lot of reasons look, for that. Here's the thing. It is, um, let me see if I can put it a different way. So the trajectory, you know, basically, you know, spending a lot of my time at Stanford, traveling to San Francisco over time, the trajectory is down and to the right. Yeah. It is just like, if you took stop motion it looks horrible, like garbage piling up, people attacking each other in the streets, crazy things happening, and it's very post-apocalyptic, post-COVID. Yeah. And the thing is that, you know, California is the future of America, as people say, right? And a lot of San Francisco's bad ideas were adopted, for example, by Austin, you know, and other cities uh, where you got the same kinds of problems adopted by Austin, and now Austin's showing some of the same power outages and other kinds of things, right? And... Um, you know, like I'm not negative for the sake of being negative. Let me explain, right? I'm I'm simply trying to enumerate a bunch of facts that, like, just like Satya Nadella. I don't think you're being saying, negative. I think you're being. I think if I were to label you, I would t- label you as a techno utopian. I, you know, some people would say I'm a. I'm not even a utopian, really. Um, I'm a. Uh, some people would call me a paranoid optimist, <laughs> right? And and the, the reason for that is kind of like you know Andy Grove's book Only the Paranoid Survive. Uh huh. Sure. Right? And was it Grove? I think it was Grove. Right? Only the Paranoid Survive. Balaji, listen, Balaji, I, I've never had to do this before. We're gonna have to wrap this up. I thought you were gonna be the one to have to wrap this up three hours ago. Sure. But, but I actually have to be somewhere in, in less than thirty minutes, and I need some time to get there. Great. I don't even have that much time to even wrap this up the way I'd like to, which was kind of. I, anyway, look, man, this has been very useful for me. This conversation cool. has challenged a lot of my thinking and maybe given me a lot to think about that I think I'll be incorporating in my in my in my mind as I work through problems over the next few weeks at the very least. I really appreciate you coming on. I hope and would love to find some way to do something more creative in the future, maybe a kind of panel sure. event. But I want to give you the last, you know, the floor here to say whatever you like and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Sure. So I do have a book coming out. Um, it'll be free. You can go to balajis.com for slash sign up. B-A-L-A-J-I-S 
com front slash sign up and get it. And I think that uh, when does it come out? Answer, I've actually written like you know 15 chapters, so I'm going to start hopefully okay. releasing it March 1st. And uh, so just sign up there. Perfect. So this and comes out March 1st. So we're actually yeah. So that goes through, I think, a bunch of the points that we discussed and maybe some new ones and continues the discussion from here. So if you've got to jump, why don't we why don't we wrap there? All right, awesome. I'm going to release this second part, Balaji, on the main feed because it took us a little while to really get into the part of the discussion that I wanted everyone to hear. If you're interested in hearing the first part of our conversation, head over to patreon.com slash hidden forces where you can listen to Balaji make the case for DLT for how cryptocurrencies are reorganizing capitalism, commerce, education. He also shares some news in the first part about a venture that he started in education, which is absolutely fascinating. And the last 30 minutes or so of that conversation is the beginning of what we basically spent the last two hours discussing, namely the network state, but specifically the game theory around how we get from here to there. Hidden Forces premium subscribers also gain access to the transcripts of every episode, including this one, as well as the rundowns, which are elaborate show notes and documents that I put together ahead of every recording. They include charts, images, tons of hyperlinks to primary source material that can help you dig deeper into whatever topic we cover on any given week. They're basically compressed versions of the entire process and database of knowledge and computation that I go through in order to educate myself ahead of each and every conversation that I have on this podcast. Balaji, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. Okay, thank you, sir. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.